Welcome to the Modern Assyrian program on ANB Sad. My name is Carmen Morad. My special guest today is Dr. Adrina Alhas. Adrina Alhas is the Marketing and Communication Director for the Stanislaus County Fair and an adjunct professor at Modesto Junior College and lecturer at Stanislaus State Communications Department. She graduated with her Master's in Communication from University of the Pacific in 2004 and received her Doctorate in Educational Leadership from CSU Stanislaus in 2011. Adrena's marketing strategies and tactics for the fair have received several recognitions, the most recent being named Publicist of the Year by PR News. Other awards include Honorable Mention for Best Event Marketer for PR News, First Place Awards through Western Fairs Association, also known as the WFA, for Best Social Media Campaign, as well as Second Place Award for other social media categories through the WFA. In 2017, Adrena was a recipient of the Modesto Bees 20 Under 40 Award she created the award-winning Empower Lounge at her local fair, which is geared towards inspiring young girls to be great leaders in our community, giving girls the confidence to be themselves through workshops and giving them the skills needed to empower others as much as empowering themselves. Adrena is married and has three children. Welcome, Adriana. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking time out of your super busy schedule. You are a published author, you're a professor at Modesto Junior College, and you somehow manage to handle your personal life, your professional life, and still have time to contribute through all that you do for the Assyrian community. I try. <laughs> I try. It's. Um, it is a balancing act because you know I do have three children. I'm married, so, but at the same time, you know we are educated in this country, and I think those that are educated in this country have to give back to our Assyrian community first, and that's how I've always. That's my perspective. That's how I've always um, been brought up, uh, and that's what I try at least try to do. You know whether it's through the Assyrian festival or making people aware of the Assyrian genocide and uh, making my kids know, uh, you know, taking my kids to church and uh, Assyrian school and, and so forth, like a lot of the Assyrian moms are doing these days. Um, and that's a way to also give back to the community is raising your children through church, making sure they understand our language, our heritage, our culture, and, and who we are as Assyrian people, because then when they grow up, they'll do the same for their children and their kids and so forth. So it's... It is up to us to, that's how we get, at least I try to give back that way. And you do it very well, Adrina. We often talk about in this program about preservation and advancement. The preservation is what we do with our uh, social clubs, with our church, our faith plays such an important role mm -hmm. in our lives. And we raise our kids with the same values that we were raised. Mm -hmm. But living or growing up in the United States, you were born here yeah. in San Jose. And, and the way that we try to combine both of them, as you said it beautifully, it's a balancing act. It is. Right? So let's talk about uh, you a little bit. Okay. Um, we've had an opportunity. I've had the privilege of working with you on the Assyrian Festival. Uh, what you did with your communication skills, and that's what you teach mm -hmm. with communication department at MJC, yeah. but you're also the marketing and public relations director at the Stanislaus County Fairgrounds, yeah. which is quite an accomplishment. That, that I'm very proud Thank that we you. have you oh, yeah. to Thank do that. So you brought your talents to the Assyrian Festival, and that was almost three, three years ago, four yeah. years now. It's been uh, that yeah, long. almost three. Yeah. No, it's been almost four. You're right. It, it will be the fourth one in yes, September. So uh, the way you did it, and especially what I loved, Adrena, is when you had our quote, which was, immerse yourself in the culture, culture that, that started, started it all. all. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. 
Yeah. It is. You're inviting people to immerse themselves in your culture, and that's what it, it was all about. It's about people eating your food, authentic food that was ma that is made by the Assyrian women in our church. I mean, it, that's what the authenticity of the of the festival is. You know, with you doing the exhibit, you know, the opening ceremony and, yeah. and so forth. That is the authenticity of our culture and bringing people into our culture was was um, through all these things that we 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 accomplished those few years. So yeah, well, you did a fantastic job, and I learned a lot from your skills and how you do it. So I bet your employers are extremely pleased I that hope so. that you do that for them. <laughs> Um, let's talk about uh, how you decided to pick this particular field of work. What prompted you to continue your education and get your doctorate? So I started at MJC after high school and then um, I continued on to Cal Poly and I was majoring in journalism actually and I was working for the newspaper at school. I interned at um, radio stations at uh, NBC affiliate news station and I found journalism to be n not quite where I wanted to be because it was a lot of it's it's a lot of hard work and you start at with any job you start at the bottom but with this one it was a lot harder and I didn't and I really wanted to be the person in the background I didn't want to be in front of the camera and doing all you know all that grunt <laughs> work that some of the reporters do it's a hard job that they that they have uh, then I took a PR class at Cal Poly Public Relations and I absolutely fell in love with it because it was strateg how to strategize, how mm -hmm. to brand, how mm -hmm. to, and my professor worked for eBay at that time. And back then, it was, this is 2001, <laughs> eBay was just up and coming. Sure. And for my professor who later landed a VP role in marketing at eBay and he was teaching our class and he, I mean, I learned a lot from him and uh, that's how I fell in love with the field and then I ended up transferring to University of the Pacific in Stockton and my PR professor there we call her Dr. Mom, Dr. Hackley, was mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. Um, she really took the time to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation mm -hmm. with the students mm -hmm. and really be there for us and teaching us how to strategically write a press release. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, people think, oh, I can write, I can write a press release. It's just the who, what, where. No, really, it's there's a strategy behind it. And, you know, you're taught these skills in, in college and and then, you know, well, the hard part for me was finding a job afterwards, <laughs> you know, yeah. as with any college student. But mm -hmm. um, I think interning and um, networking during those college years is essential to hopefully your career later on because you'll, you know, networking and knowing the right people should try to get you into those, uh, opening up those do doors for you. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, one of your professors. Obviously, I can tell that she mentored you. Yes. She really meant a lot to you. So in education and in professional mm -hmm. lives, we have those who mentor us that we learn from. Uh, talk to me about who has mentored you personally when it comes to family life. Yeah, uh, that's an easy one. My mom, my grandmother, who recently just passed away oh. uh, June 10th, and um, and you know these women that have been in my life have been very humble, um, with their head low, working hard. You know they don't show off. They don't talk about what they do. They don't they don't boast about um, all the good work that they have done. They just kind of do it and and move on. And I've you know I've learned that being humble with whatever you're doing is really the key to success. Kindness is power, as I, as I mentioned in my book. It really is, you know, and, uh, but at the same time, my mom says you gotta be strong with those people that come at you that are, you know, not so nice. You know, you, you have to stand your ground at some point. You can't let people walk all over you. Mm -hmm. And that's been a hard thing for me because I was very passive growing up. Growing up. My mom thought, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to be with her <laughs> through college and so forth. Whereas my younger sister, she had the mouth and she she had, uh, you know, she would stick up for me and for herself. Whereas me, I was a lot quieter and kind of would just let things happen. 
I've learned throughout the years that it is not the case. You have to kind of stand your ground and not let people walk all over you and, and say things to you that, be, that will emotionally disturb you. And it's, it's hard to, for example, having a toxic boss in the workplace. That was hard for me to maneuver around because I didn't know as a new person going into the workforce how to deal with something like this. Hmm. I had never, I thought everybody, wa everybody wanted me to be successful. You know, I thought everybody was there to help and help you nourish but, and grow, but that's, it really is not the case. Real world, you're on your own. Well, you grew up in an environment that was very caring. It, yeah, and that, and that, and see, yes, that's the thing is, uh, my parents, yes, they are very caring and that's, how, that's what we learned, but the real world is harsh. And that's what yes. I talk about in my book is, really um, understanding what the real world is before you get there. Because I had no idea. I was kind of, it was, it was just a shock for me to try to maneuver my way um, with a toxic work environment. So what prompted you to write the book? I know it goes back yeah. to your position with the fairgrounds. And, yeah. uh, and, and tell us about how that came to be and what prompted you to go from the experiences you had to saying, I need to write my experiences in a book so I can yeah. share what I've learned and how it has contributed to my success so others can learn from it. Yeah, and I'm still learning, so it's not like I know every uh, everything I'm still learning myself continuously and I think the day you think you know everything should be the day you stop working really mm -hmm. um, or Very educating good. people because I'm constantly being educated whether it's my staff or my students or I tell them I go I learn from you guys every day you know mm -hmm. you're in my class whatever you're taking from me I'm taking I'm taking whatever I can from you um, so it goes, it goes both ways. But in, to answer your question, uh, I started at the fair about almost 10 years ago. It'll, oh, wow. nine years ago. Uh, and I went in because they were working with my schedule with my kids and I needed flexibility, but I also wanted to work, you know, and be out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't just want to stay home with, you know, as much as it's great staying home <laughs> and I, you know, nothing against being a stay at home mom, but for me, what worked was having that balance of working part-time and being making sure I, I was there for the kids. So I took the job at the fair as the marketing director and they worked around my schedule. And throughout the years, I really have learned how to, not to just manage, but how to be a leader. Because there's a big difference between a leader and a manager. Anybody can manage, but you have to be, a, you have to learn how to lead. lead people be a motivator and be kind to your staff you can't just be a dictator and tell people what to do you have to show kindness and flexibility and you know they know what is expected but at the same time there's a you know it's things happen yeah we're gonna make mistakes and we move on we learn from them so um within within those years i um, I came up with the, a few years ago, the Empower Her Lounge mm -hmm. at the fair, which is a lounge geared for girls 16 and older. And really it teaches them how to be good leaders in our community, how to give back to the community, how to brand yourself on social media. We have different topics and seminars that we work with, that we work with other women who put on these seminars. It's the Well Women Education League. Um, so I partnered with them. And we have a good, we've had a good turnout. And through that, I was like, you know, maybe if I turn this into a book, every, every um, a topic that we have at the seminar, if, we, if I write a chapter about it, it could, it could be a good book. I don't know. It's mostly for young girls, mm -hmm. uh, high school age, college age, that could learn from it. And eventually, I started writing a year ago. And then I hired a writing coach because I was like, how do I start this? <laughs> That's the hard part is how do you start? So I, I did hire a writing coach just to help with the tone. And she said to me, make sure you are writing like you are sitting next to an 18 year old girl and you're talking to her. And that's how the book is written. Like I'm talking to an 18 year old. So they can relate so to the subject. So they can relate subject. to some of the situations and some of the, some of the topics. Um, 
you know, and also about a couple years ago, uh, you know, my grandmother would always talk about the stories of my great grandmother, my great grandparents surviving the Assyrian genocide, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. was them for them. It was in 1918 from an Otomi. Yes. yes. Um, and I, and a couple years ago, I sat down and I talked to her about it in detail because she would talk about it, but it wasn't really the details that um, that I needed for the book because I she would always talk about how they made it to the refugee camps in in Iraq and how the women worked together in the refugee camps um, that made life a little easier for them. Like because the British government, Mara, they would supply so much uh, food for them, uh, they, did, they needed to preserve the food. So the women knew how to do all that. Mm -hmm. And my grandma would joke and said, the men didn't know how to do any of that <laughs> stuff. It was the women. You right, know, they, right. And the women got together and, and um, educated the kids in these camps, you know, for six months they were there. So what, how else were they gonna, you know. Survive. Survive, it's survival of the fittest, right? So, it was, you know, the women worked together and I thought, if women can work together during a time of war and death and, and I mean, survival mode, I don't understand why women can't work together in, the, in corporate America. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it survival of the fittest in corporate America and anywhere that we work or shouldn't we work together cohesively to help each other out? Because if you're successful and you help me and I help you, I mean, it's a win-win for both. So that's what the book is really about, is about women working together in the workforce and helping each other out. Because why... And how to give back. How to give back. Because I don't, the whole competition and being jealous and gossip at work and, <laughs> and try to sabotage somebody's reputation. And yes. The, it is horrible. It is. It is. It's disgusting to me. And I don't under, I've never understood that. Um, like you said, because I wasn't brought up that way. So when I went in the workforce and it started happening to me, I just, I couldn't comprehend it. So, and it's not my personality to do it back. I see. You know, I didn't want to fall in the trap of the way to succeed is to sabotage and to climb all over people to climb that ladder. Because when you climb down, down that ladder, you're going to see everybody that, you know, you tried to hurt. And mm. then that's not going to do you, you know, any justice. The word empowerment, I love how you have the title written. There's a lot of meaning yeah. in how you came up with that title. Uh, the empowerment, but it also the her. Mm -hmm. So, so I love how you connect your modern professionalism, your education, mm -hmm. to the values that you have from the stories of your grandmother. Yeah, the connection is made beautifully in the book, Thank you. and I would like to recommend that everyone watching this program orders it. I ordered mine on Amazon, but I also have one here. Yeah. So thank you for that's your copy. Thank yeah. you. I'm I'm honored <laughs> to have it signed by you and to thank keep you. it. Um, it's very important that us women, and this doesn't necessarily have to be for mm -hmm. us um, Assyrian women, but as, as mothers, as yeah. professionals, we do have this balancing act. And our culture is who we are. So to take from the values that we are used to, the values that really make us who we are as our identity, is in this book. And yeah. I think it's fantastic. Um, I want to ask you about anyone who is locally here, how can they be involved to actually have more information on that lounge? Can you give oh, us a yeah. little bit more um, information? They can go on to standcofair.com and it's the Empower Her Lounge. Uh, if they, uh, maybe for next year would be a great way to, if they want to speak at the lounge, if they have other ideas that they want to collaborate with me on the lounge, I think it's fantastic. Maybe getting other cultures and different women from other cultures to help out. Absolutely. Is, is also would be great. Um, but, you know, with this, with this book, like you said, it is about my ancestors. Mm -hmm. It is about their story. And we've talked about this. It is our job to tell, to tell their story. It's Absolutely. our job to have their voices heard because they had no voices. When my great grandmother was carrying her five month old 
for 30 days from Urmi to north, northern Iraq. And you hear these stories from a lot, yes. of, a lot of the survivors. And also what's happening to our people in Iraq and Syria right now, they need a voice. You know, we have to talk about what is happening. And instead of talking about them being the Assyrian or the Christian minorities that they report on, it's no, we're Assyrian. Yeah, we're Christian, but we're Assyrian people in mm -hmm. Iraq and and in Syria. So that we have to recognize that. And there's, it's not just me. There's a lot of us that are trying to do this. I have a lot of friends that go to Iraq that you know have been part of this community where they go and try to make a difference. And um, and I hope it continues. And you know, we were just talking about so many other women that are you know, speaking in Harvard or, you know, having all the all these amazing experiences trying to make um, the Assyrian name known to the world. Absolutely. At be. a different level, too. Yeah. Um, I think each and every one of us, depending if we were born here like you were, or if we were born in the Middle East or back home like I was, we are, were offered some unique mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. Adriana. And we each have our gifts and talents that uh, God has given us. And, and how we tap into them mm -hmm. is how we can actually implement them and apply them, whether it's at the festival to, yeah. to have such pride that we all did. All How many volunteers? 300 volunteers? I don't that, know, but we were all dancing. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's a fun event. It you really know, it's is. It's fun when it's together and it's nice it, it, it really is it, it's a sense of community it's yeah. pride uh, especially when you have non-assyrians that come and say wow we didn't know there were so many of you yeah. here we oh, have we didn't visitors. know you guys existed exactly we're yeah, always no, we showing off <laughs> we exist we just don't have a country we're spread all over but exactly. we're here exactly and we're mostly in Turlock <laughs> Modesto Turlock Modesto Riverbank and yeah. we're, growing. we're growing our community has really grown we have a history of over 115 years in Turlock what I would like to talk to you and and make sure our audience are aware of uh, I'm so impressed with the fact that you were born here in the United States but you are so in tune and connected with your church with your heritage and culture mm -hmm. and you also teach your kids to speak Assyrian and and what makes that happen is it your mom and dad the way they raised you is it they really made sure that that you were speaking the language and share with us some of the things that have now as an adult really stick with yeah. you and you know are effective. Yeah, and I talk about it in my book. It, it's, it has to do with my, my parents for sure. And I, you know, my grandmother was constantly around us and she instilled a lot in us too. And, but my parents were very strict on us. It, what you can't go sleep at people's houses. Yes. Okay. No sleepovers. No sleepovers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something I tell my my daughter, who's a she's turning eleven soon, and she's like, "How come all my friends can go stay the night mm -hmm. and I can't?" And I said, "We don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to allow you to do that. It doesn't for what? It doesn't make sense." So then I hear my mom's voice because she told me she would say the same thing to uh -huh. me over and over. <laughs> you know, so it's the same thing that I'm yes. telling my daughter, but it. But now that I'm older and now that I'm a mom, yes, it makes sense. Just because we're living in America doesn't mean we need to Americanize ourselves completely. Mm. We still have our Assyrian traditions and our values. And my mom would take us to church every Sunday. We knew that was the routine. We mm -hmm. had to go. And now my brother's a Shamasha, the Raya Vieva, you know, and, and all this stuff. Cause, and my, now my son wants to be Shamasha. And he's eight <laughs> years old, and it, which is funny, but funny because he wants to be shamasha to do bisma and collect money but but it's cute because it's the environment the environment because you know i take them you know we take our kids to church so they see it and they love going mm -hmm. so it's not like i'm forcing it on them uh in the beginning yeah you know when they're little you take them they they don't know what's going on but of course you teach them and sure. you know and then you've got our kashish and shamashe that all are constantly there teaching them you know, when I take them to a Syrian school here at Mara Day, they have amazing teachers. Yes, they amazing do. Amazing teachers that do, that dedicate their lives to teaching our kids a Syrian mm -hmm. and about our culture. So you have to thank them for doing that too. But really, it, it stems from your household. It and does. my parents, my dad, you better, you have to marry an Assyrian guy. 
Mm -hmm. You, you know, he would take us to conventions and he would take us, you know, we were, I was part of the volleyball team for civic club for a while. And, and, you know, he, in, he instilled that heritage, that pride in yes. us. And, you know, my mom would take us to church. So we had that part going. Um, but my dad was very strict. You know, we couldn't just go to convention. He was behind us. <laughs> you can't go to the bar at seven o'clock, you gotta sit down with me. But he wanted us to be included in in all this stuff just so we could see our our traditions, you know, and I we do that with my our kids now. We try to. Um, so really it starts from the home really and uh, when when you instill that in your kids, you know, you you hope that they grow up, you know, um, and having that in them. I remember being at Cal Poly and my friend Nahara and I, we were roommates. We were scared to go out because my mom, I, I was scared my mom would find out. <laughs> so those are, so we wouldn't go out. Literally, mm -hmm. we would just go to, we'd go to school, you know, we, we'd have fun and stuff, but at the same time, we were afraid to do anything because mm -hmm. I was afraid my, you know, my mom was going to find out. But it was that, it was that fear, not, not that we fear, but it was the respect that we had yes, for our parents. Yes. It's that respect that you have and, and you know, you try to instill that in, in your children because mm -hmm. it is all, all about self-respect at the end of the day because the way you present yourself to your community, to to outsiders from outside of your community who yes. are non mm -hmm. how you they have to have their, that respect for you because at the end of the day, you're, you are representing the Assyrian culture, you're representing your family, you're representing your parents and your mom, that's what my dad would say, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> it just they instill that in us and it's it's all about respect you it know absolutely and, and is. you know and you know this you know we, i'm sure <laughs> you, with your sons and and how you were raised and you know yes. it's um i have a lot of friends who were raised just like me so mm -hmm. so i do need to do a shout out to your dad oh, jonathan yeah. benjamin yes. and marina benjamin Thank you. Uh, yes. fantastic people very active in the community mm -hmm. In fact, to your mom, uh, Marina, we worked together on uh, the festival yes. committee, very committed and dedicated. So I see she's done a great job. Aww, I see the values. She I she... see the values in her. And, and obviously, you pass that on to your children. And um, going back to the impact that, that raising a family and parenting, yeah. I want to say, made to you, um, the chapter in your book really touched me. Uh, that you interviewed your grandmother mm -hmm. and your in-laws. And uh, let's talk about the event that you'll be a speaker at, oh, yeah. at California State University, Stanislaus. It's our second annual mm -hmm. uh, Assyrian Genocide Remembrance. It is on a campus at a state university, which mm -hmm. is an honor for our community. Um, We've always done the genocide awareness and genocide remembrance mm -hmm. in our little private um, we yeah. call them, or church, which is very important because this is an event that is for our umta and ita and combined. But it also makes a difference for awareness, to raise yeah. awareness for non-Assyrians. Every historian or scholar that I interview, Adrena, I ask them, how do we start a conversation about genocide with non-Assyrians? Yeah. Uh, it's such a heavy subject matter, but you and I sitting here today, we are descendants of genocide yeah. survivors. We are here because they survived. Mm -hmm. So we owe it to them yeah. for us to be that voice. So um, on August 7th, 2018, uh, this coming year, next month, uh, on campus at the um, Main Stage Theater yeah. at 6 p.m. We will have a keynote speaker, and uh, uh, you are one of the speakers that will speak that evening. And tell us what is it that you will be talking about and, and what you want to share, because we will have dignitaries there, we will have assemblymen there, yeah. we will have mayors, uh, we invite non-Assyrians from other communities that have had 
this shared experience of genocide yeah. and persecution. It's a platform for us to tell our story. So I'm looking forward to you, Adrena, yeah. to hear from you and give us just some, perhaps some highlights of what you'll be talking about. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me to that. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, really, it's not, it's not my story to tell, it's my great-grandmother's story. And really, that's the whole premise of the book. Um, it's her voice, my grandmother's voice, and just being able to share what she went through, you know, from leaving her child by the tree just to mm. survive and making that de ultimate decision to leave her child because they were killing kids in front of their parents or they were killing you. I, I mean, to make that decision as a mother is horrific. Yes. So telling that story and that his cries were the one saved him because she went back for him. She couldn't oh. leave him. I know. It's wow. like I get I get teary. I just think mm -hmm. like every time mm -hmm. I talk about it. Um so that, you know, his cries saved him and he became a writer. Wow. When he um in Iraq, he was a very very um famous writer. So I want to share all that with the audience because these are these were lives that nobody talked about that was survived and you know for 30 days they walked and then my great grandfather left them at the refugee camp because he went back to Odemi to look for his sisters and they never were they were never found so they were either killed kidnapped and forced into uh, becoming Muslims or whatever the case may be. Um, he never found his sisters. All of my great grandmother's sisters were killed. They never were found. She wow. was the only one to to escape and survive. So, you know, that's that's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of people die, have passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, died and were. Um, the turmoil that happened to these families ha has to be recognized. And, you know, there's the Crimson Field. I don't know if have you Rosie read Malik. Rosie Malik. Malik. I, yes. I read that book years ago. Yeah, yes. I mean, years ago. And it touched my it touched me so much that and I was young then when I read it. So I read it, but I didn't really put it into perspective of, wow, my great grandmother also went through this mm -hmm. and her family was killed in front of her and my great grandfather. I didn't put it into until I got married and had my own kids and, you know, talking to my grandmother, mm -hmm. then, you know, it all clicked, clicked, you know, and it all made sense that, you know, she did a beautiful job with it. Um, it needs to be made into a movie, mm -hmm. you know, like the promise. Have you seen that with, with the yes. Armenian genocide? Yes. So we need to do one for the Assyrian genocide. Yes, yeah. the Armenians and Greeks went through it, but mm -hmm. we need that voice. We need something to come out to have it recognized. Well, it, it's extremely important to have a platform, whether mm -hmm. it's at a university, yeah. whether it's in a church. There are children of our kids of our age that this is the first time they're having that aha moment like you did yeah. when you read the book. We hear about it. We grew up. Uh, my grandfather was always telling the stories yeah. and he would get teary eyed. But I think with each and every one of us, there is a time and moment in our life yeah. that we understand it, we grasp it. In fact, uh, in 2014, when ISIS, uh, you know, started with Mosul, yeah. I was watching CNN and I shared this with my non-Assyrian friends. Yeah. And when I heard uh, what they were talking about, I said, oh my God, this sounds familiar. My grandfather used to tell us those stories. Isn't that so, sad that history is repeating itself? It's very sad, uh, but we have an obligation and yeah. a responsibility in our own way. It is, you're Each right. one of us have an opportunity, and I am so looking forward to hearing from you um, as, as someone who is so in tune with her culture, with her past, with her future. You're contributing uh, in a very unique way. Uh, with teaching young women, perhaps uh, at any age, yeah. women who need to learn from your experience and be in touch with their own heritage. 
Uh, That's really a key, key, key thing. Because if you don't know who you are, then how are you going to educate other people? So that's, it really is, is the key. And, you know, we have a lot of our Assyrian people that have been born here and live here. And a lot of them don't really care what's happening in the Middle East. They say it's not happening here, so yeah. who cares? But no, if you, if, you want, if you don't take care of your own people first, then how are you willing to take care of other people? You know, I understand that the world, uh, we're all human and there's a lot of people suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get that perspective. But you have to, for me at least, I have to start with my own people before I can get to... You know, you, you try to help everybody, but I think our people really need our voice uh, to be projected in order for theirs to be heard. Absolutely, you're right. And you know, to you and me, it might be something that's far away, but I also work with refugees and mm -hmm. new immigrants that come. And to a lot of them, this is very fresh. It's very new. For mm -hmm. them to hear someone like Adriana, who was born and raised here, to have these tools of success, to have mm -hmm. these, what you and I are talking about, to one of them, it could be the first time they're hearing oh, it. Yeah. So it, it's such an opportunity for someone to connect with them, for someone who looks like them, who talks like them, yeah. who shares that culture. It means a lot. So thank you for writing this book. Oh, no, thank you. This book is amazing, and I really do hope that, uh, of course, we have a, a shot of it here, but the empower has to do with her, and I think that's so smart. Thank you. <laughs> I know you came up with it. You have great ideas, but um, we need to celebrate each other. We need to celebrate each other's success celebrate each other's achievements and accomplishments and and really uh, contribute to yeah. one another, which is the premise of your book. So I completely it, agree with it. Yeah. And you're like and you've always done a good job with it, helping other women and making sure the other Assyrian women are also recognized. I mean how I mean that's how you've connected with me and it's been wonderful um, friendship. You Absolutely. Know, and I, and I've I loved it. So so thank you. Thank you, Adrina. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for writing this book. And we will uh, hear more about Adrina and we will see and have her talk and uh, the important, powerful message that she has about uh, the leadership that we each have in our own uh, self-empowerment mm -hmm. and how we learn from each other and from each other's success. Adrina, in closing, do you have anything that you want to say to our viewers and our audience? Perhaps someone at a young age, uh, imagine yourself when you were Aww. starting out. I didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anything. I just, uh, you know, just know that you're going to, that I didn't know that I had to one day make a decision about whether I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, a working mom, or you know, a uh, part-time, working part-time and taking care, it's, you don't, they don't teach you that in college, you know, uh, those are tough decisions that yeah. you have to make when you do become a mom, you know, and, um, and whether you are a stay-at-home mom or you are a working mom, you know, nobody can judge you and tell you how to live your life, well, you have to do what is best for your family, um, and for you. Yes. You know, because there's a lot of moms that are better moms um, when they're working. It's, I have a lot of friends that way. And there's a lot of moms that have a master's degree. They have a, a high education, but mm -hmm. they want to stay at home. And that's okay, too. But for the young girl who's in college and try to make, trying to make it in the real world, you know, I want to tell them to speak up. Don't be passive. Don't think that the, you have rights as an employee wherever you work, if things, if something is happening that you know is not right, say something, have that communication in a respectful way, the dialogue with coworkers or with your boss. Mm -hmm. I made that mistake of just letting things go and letting things happen. So it would, it would just escalate in my, in my mind. And, um, I learned, I learned now to communicate better. Like if I don't agree with something, I say it. I don't agree mm -hmm. with you, but in mm -hmm. a respectful way. All, yeah. Everything is with respect and, you know, uh, honesty without tact is just plain cruelty, they say. Oh, I like that. You okay. know, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to be honest with people and just in a tactful way, 
when the right time comes. But as a young person going into the real world, speak up, you have a voice, um, you have time to change majors and you don't want to go this route, but you want to go this route. You have time, you know, when you're not married with kids, it's, it's okay to do that. It's okay to make those decisions. And sometimes, um, taking on a job that you're not happy with, you find something that you know you're going to be successful in, that you can hone those skills and, and use them. I think it also has to do with living in this country mm -hmm. that gives us so many opportunities, that yeah. gives us so many ways that we have options and choices that we can, that we feel empowered, that we yeah. can do it, right? Yeah, you can. You can, yeah, we have those options here in America. Um, sometimes you feel, some students might feel stuck because of tuition and they're like, but I don't want to extend it for another five, you know, or whatever. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that was my thought process. I remember, oh, it's so expensive. But at the same time, I did change my majors, you know, uh, and uh, it took me five years, but I, you know, you do it and you get through it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, then I did the master's program, which was wonderful. But at the same time, um, you know, you have to make sure also that you're networking with the right people, especially with your professors and, and sure. um, doing those internships as a as a young woman and making those connections because it'll get you to to hopefully your next job. Uh, as a professor, when you teach, and tell us about that a little bit, what kind of camaraderie do you have, and do you have any Assyrian students? I love my students. I've been teaching for 10, 11 years now. I, um, I, lo I love teaching because they're young, and um, a lot of times I, I try to connect with them because I'm into pop culture and we'll talk about the real housewives of I don't know what <laughs> or Game of Thrones. You know, you try to connect with your students sure. um, and a lot of them, you cannot be a professor that dictates to your students and expects respect back. It doesn't, I've had, I had professors like that and it was like, here's, here, read chapters five through <laughs> 10 and we're gonna give you a test. It doesn't work that way. You have to have interaction with the students. They have to learn by doing, which was Cal Poly's motto. Um, but I, at least with my students, I try to be, I try to connect with them. You know, I try to be honest with them, especially with the girls in, at, in, in my class. Um, with the men too, you know, you have to always make sure, um, that everybody respects everybody in the class because I'm teaching speech and you know they have to be comfortable with each other sure. so we confidence try to, confidence we try to joke around and do a lot of group work and you, you know so it's fun I've had Assyrians in my in my class and I love it when I see an Assyrian last name because I'm like ah. <laughs> I'm gonna see if they could do an Assyrian speech yeah. speech about Assyrian people but I've, ha I've had um, Assyrians uh, mm -hmm. so they're at MJC and they and I love when they you know just to kind of help them out with hey you should be doing this you should um, taking this kind of counseling them on, sure, on sure. helping out the best that I could um, you know then I've got the young students who are just out of high school and they're always my favorite because they're so they think I'm smart and <laughs> They, they think I know a lot, so they, they you know, and then they, they try to do, uh, they have the utmost respect for their, for mm -hmm. their peers. Mm -hmm. And then I have the older, older people, like 50 and older, who mm -hmm. are just getting back to school because she was a stay-at-home mom sure. for all these years, and now her kids are in college and she wants to go back. And I love them, too, because they're just as respectful, and they mm -hmm. bring in so much knowledge. Because if any of the younger ones are acting up, the older ones take the older ones in my class take care of them and I you know you try to do that with each class I've been teaching for 10 years now and you know I remember all my students I keep in touch with all of them I tell them use me as your network use me mm -hmm. for later on so if you need a reference letter if you need anything from me email me I'll be there for you whether it's six months from now or five years from now you have my contact information and they do. A lot of them will email me. One of them bought a car for my husband. So that, that was always, 
that's always that's good he helped her out so yeah. it's it's you know, I can you tell that it's that. your passion because your face lights up it when you're is. talking about your students. I love my students, and a lot of them, I try to hire them at, at the fair, mm -hmm. so they'll work. I've hired, one of them is my videographer from Stan State, because I was teaching at Stan State. Mm -hmm. um, so I hired him on, and he's been my video guy for the last three years. That's fantastic. He does our commercials. He comes every Good. year. So, Good. Yeah. I use them for their skills. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wonderful because you bec you provide that mentorship for them, whether it's education and then, you know, with yeah. their employment and all of that. Because living in a small community like we are, mm -hmm. networking is extremely it's important, and key. especially our community. We really need to help each other out because yeah. in Turlock we run into each other. You know, know, Turlock Modesto, we have a good uh, thousands and thousands of yeah. Assyrians. So um, very proud of you and thank all you, you do, Adrina. Uh, thank you for writing this letter. Thank you for, as busy as you are, finding time to contribute, to give back, whether it's the church, the festival. And I know how hard of, uh, work it is, but we do need your gifts and your talents and all that you contribute because they're very unique. They, you, what you bring with you is something that truly not many of us know how to do. So don't stop. No, I'll, I mean, <laughs> I'll try not to. It's, uh, you know, it is a balancing act. And if they ask for help, I'm willing to help in any way that I can. Um, I don't ever push my um, knowledge to people. Mm -hmm. If somebody asks, I'm happy to share. I'm happy to help, but I never force myself into helping or doing you know it's it's mm -hmm. kind of it's i'm here to help and if anybody asks i'm willing to share knowledge because you can't keep your knowledge you gotta share it you gotta you share it you gotta i mean wh what is it that you know what's it there for somebody had a quote about that but i forgot what it was i'll have to email it to you <laughs> email it you, to me yeah, i'll gotta, use it in one of the you interviews gotta, yeah, you gotta <laughs> share your knowledge you can't just keep it in it's absolutely. it's a, it's, a word, it's wasteless absolutely so. so i'm looking forward to your next book hopefully oh. uh <laughs> um we're excited uh, this book should be at the Stanislaus um, University here at the Modern Assyrian mm -hmm. Heritage Collection. Um, and we should actually have uh, a copy of it at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., where we were not too long ago. Uh, any book that, that has anything with Assyrians, the there is a section there. At the I African. Sent it, I sent it to the Library of Congress because I had to register the book. I had to get a yes. Congress number. So I. It's been shipped to them. We'll Excellent. see where they put it. <laughs> Excellent. We'll go look for it next time we're in DC. Thank you, Adrena, Thank for you. joining us. Thank we you look for forward to me. your future success. Uh, any endeavor that you participate, let us know. We'll go ahead and promote your book and your Thank next you. one. And we're looking forward to your speaking engagements. Let us know. Thank you. With um, A and B, we'll be more than honored to Thank cover you. them for you. Uh, this concludes our conversation and our interview with Dr. Adrina Alhas. Join us next time on The Modern Assyrian.